that was a minister, in case you're wondering. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Um, this is a wonderful turnout. Uh, we've had great participation uh, all across the community, um, whether it be the our students in both of our high schools, our administration, um, the healthcare, downtown businesses, our citizens, uh, you name it. Uh, we've had nearly 100 participants uh, in interview sessions over the last two days. So, you know, that's incredible. And so big kudos uh, to all of you and thank you so much. Um, as you know, we have the Iowa Downtown Resource Center here, their assessment team. Uh, we're excited to have them here. We've been working on a date, haven't we, Jimmy T, for a while. So we're excited. <laughs> we're excited to have them here. This is a great resource for the city of Carroll, for the state of Iowa. And um, so anyway, they've been hard at work uh, visiting with many of you. Uh, getting a lot of great input, and now we're, we're bringing it all home. And so we're going to have this time together to uh, go over things, and then uh, I believe we'll get a full, extensive written report uh, later on. So uh, without any further ado, I do want to say that this has been a great partnership with the City of Carroll um, and our new, our new City Manager, the City Council, uh, Carroll County Growth Partnership, and the Chamber, so, and all of you. So anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, great crowd today. This is way above average for downtown assessment visit. Um, my name is Jim Engel, and I'm uh, director of the Iowa Downtown Resource Center, uh, which is a part of the Iowa Economic Development Authority. And what the Iowa Downtown Resource Center does is offer uh, technical assistance and um, grant programs, uh, educational programs, things like that, networking opportunities for any community in Iowa that wants to make improvements in their downtown area. So we have a staff of nine people that travel the state, we have a fun job, we see all kinds of towns, small towns, big towns, neighborhood commercial districts, you name it, and, and we try, try to help them. Um, I want to, before I um, talk about what we did for the last three days, I want to introduce uh, the team here, and these are the only notes I had because I thought it would be embarrassing if I forgot someone's name. Uh, but we're going we're to start over here with uh, Sam Kessel from Boltman Mink Inc. A, a, the, I guess you're all over the place, but Sam works out of Des Moines. Uh, did you call yourself a design firm? Yeah, engineering design. Engineering design. design. Okay. We have Jeff Geertz, who is a special project, projects manager at the Iowa Economic Development Authority. Jeff is on nearly all of our downtown assessment visits. We have Jim Thompson, who is an economic development specialist for the Iowa Downtown Resource Center. Jim does a lot of these visits too. Uh, we have Erin Chambers, who is with the city of Newton. So she's not one of our staff people. Community Development Director, is that your title, Erin? Yep. The city of Newton. And then we have uh, Kelly Mesher Collins, who has uh, attended the visit with us too. Um, she is part of our communications team and works very close with, with, with our staff. So that's our team. Um, this is what we did for the last couple of days. First of all, who filled out a pre-visit survey? A lot of hands going up. Okay. We had a sample of 560 people that took part in a pre-visit survey. It wasn't like a scientific survey or anything like that. I think there were six brief questions, but it helped us to know what the issues were and it helped us to know what kinds of questions to ask when we got here. So great participation with that. Uh, we looked at some previous things um, that Carol has done, some previous uh, studies. Uh, we took a driving tour of Carol. Uh, we took a walking tour of the downtown area. And then we spent a couple of days, um, uh, Ms. Kimberly said, just talking to a lot of people, different groups. We talked to bankers, we talked to realtors, we talked to a group of students, school officials, you name it. And then some individual interviews also. So we kind of feel like we immersed ourselves in, in Carroll for the last last three days and got a, a lot of a lot of good information. Um, one thing I've been telling people here in Carroll, usually when communities call us to come help them, um, they're usually at a lower bar than Carroll is. Mm -hmm. So we, we will visit and do downtown assessments in communities that have almost no downtown businesses or have buildings falling down and things like that. So this was a little bit different for us. We typically work with seven or eight themes. We didn't have as many of those here in Carroll. It was a little bit different kind of a, kind of a visit. Um, um, this is why we do what we do. 
This is why we think downtown's important. It's a, it's a reflection of your community. Oftentimes, it's kind of a gauge of your community health. You can take a look at the downtown and see how much pride people have in the downtown, the number of businesses, how the buildings have been upkept. And it, it's kind of a reflection of the whole community. It's the front porch of your community. It's what people think of when they leave town. Um, it's a community gathering place, hopefully. Not all of our downtowns are, but hopefully it's a, a place that brings people together. It re represents a quality of life and economic health of the community. Now, in a little bit, we're going to give you some recommendations. On these, these downtown assessment visits, we, we like to talk about your strengths, and, and the team did that. We, we put together what we thought were really cool. We asked you a lot of questions about that. We got information in the survey about your community strengths. Um, but then we're going to divide this presentation up in just a little bit into um, different themes that we saw. One thing I always like to say, we never set a goal to come into town and just pat you guys in the back and leave. So if we haven't annoyed somebody by the end of our presentation, we, we really didn't do our job. Because we, we consider ourselves straight shooters. Now, I don't think this is going to be as controversial as some that we're on. I think this will be pretty cool. You might not agree with everything we say, but we're going to, we're going to give you some kind of low-hanging fruit things that I think you can say, hey, we can do that. We might be able to do that this afternoon, for God's sake. So there will be some of that. There's going to be some things we say that you're going to say, oh, what a great idea, but we really can't pull that off. And then there might be some things that you're going to say, who are these crazy people? That is not something we're ever going to do at Carroll. What I would recommend is we you start at one and two there. Don't throw three away. So, so, so be dreamers, too. I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, and he's going to start by talking about the pre-visit survey we did. Thank you, Jim. As Jeff mentioned, we had 560 responses. This is I'm going to go through this very quickly, because the city will get the full survey uh, report, responses, um, all the specific individual detail uh, for each of the questions. So we just highlighted some of the, the top responses within each of the six <coughs> questions, seven questions. Well, we started out with what is the downtown's greatest strength? And what we found in your survey and what we found in person is the appearance and the cleanliness and the location of the downtown um, as well. But there were also some other categories that you see up there um, noted also. And when we asked about the downtown's greatest weakness, by far and away uh, was indicated the lack of downtown businesses. And if there's nothing else we convey to you this afternoon, I hope we can dispel a little bit, I don't know if the myth is the right word, but maybe get you to rethink about how many businesses really are downtown, because I think we, for some of you there may be a surprise as to how many are actually down there. Um, but also not enough to do, and then the next biggest category was other, and we highlighted just a couple of the, the things that came up under other. Um, but not a lot, but usually it was focused on the lack of downtown businesses. So then we asked the question, uh, what if you had $100,000 to invest in downtown, and what would you do? And really came down to a couple of main responses here. As you can see, uh, there were very specific business requests. Um, typically, on these surveys, we get a lot of more generic, like just restaurants or a clothing store. But in this case, we got quite a few very specific suggestions for types of uh, retail stores and uh, eating establishments as well. You can see there was also, and these kind of go hand in hand with not only specific business requests, but let's fill some of these vacancies we have downtown and attract new businesses and provide some incentives to do that. Um, so, and then the entertainment, and we'll talk a little bit about activities and event opportunities as well uh, this afternoon. Then we asked, well, what new business is most needed? And clothing? Um, was number one. Um, usually it's number one or two in a lot of places. Usually it's restaurant and then oftentimes followed by clothing. But I think you know part of this is uh, in people's minds right now in the community due to a couple of the, the more recent closures downtown being department store clothing related types of, uh, of vacancies. Followed by affordable um, department store. Uh, you can see again a lot of very specific uh, suggestions uh, provided in the feedback and the survey. 
restaurants, so forth. And again, there's that family activity, entertainment uh, note as well. So those are what new businesses are most needed downtown based on the, the responses we got to the survey. When we asked what new activity would bring more people downtown, um, adult, teen activity center, fun center, activity center, well, I think we have a couple of ideas for that might help with the entertainment and bringing more people downtown that we'll share in a little bit. And more community events uh, were by far the, the two highest ones, again, followed by shopping, concerts, and kind of related to the activity centers and uh, events is uh, more kids' activities as well. And then what public amenities most needed downtown? Um, places for kids. Uh, 300 out of the 560 really wanted to see more amenities for kids. Um, downtown followed by parking and green space. Um, and this was a drop down list. So these were categories they had to choose from. Um, and these were the, the four uh, top responses. Then just kind of give you an idea, we actually had a pretty nice breakdown and spread across the community of ages that responded um, to the survey. So you can see we covered just about every age group uh, except for the 14 and under, which is an unusual, but a really nice uh, mix of responses. So Jim mentioned uh, you've identified in the survey your downtown strengths. We also, during our driving tour, walking tour, I actually came in a couple of weeks early, went through the community as well. We identified some community assets and strengths. Tremendous number and size and location of parks here. The parks facilities are, are really quite amazing. Uh, Merchants Park is, uh, you know, it's one of those landmark places. Uh, Jim and I at least are big baseball fans, so it was already on our, our radar. Um, great facility. Uh, but you're also that regional hub, um, and I think hopefully you all realize the regional hub you are uh, for Western Iowa. Um, really impressive with the amount of retail here, um, the healthcare facilities, and again the recreational facilities. You have two um, wonderful school districts, um, both uh, the size of those and the facilities here are, are quite amazing again for a community the, the size of Carroll. Um, the pride in place. And that's everything from how clean the streets are, to the store windows, to the appearance of the homes and the facilities. Um, really, really shows pride in place and pride in Carroll as you go around the community. Very strong industrial base. And again, the trail system we thought was very uh, noteworthy as well. And it seems like talking to locals gets lots of use. Downtown, the, the strengths that we identified, you can see there about even though it was cited as a weakness, the, the lack of businesses, we actually think there are some strong businesses and a good cluster of businesses downtown. Uh, your events came up in many of our conversations. It's a great walkable space. Um, and you've got uh, other opportunities there down, downtown as well. The improvements have been made, the theater being downtown. Um, there are a lot of strengths, and we're gonna to touch on some of those this afternoon. And, and maybe uh, help you look at downtown in a, maybe a whole new way for some of you. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jim. I need to raise my hands, Jeff. Don't have any clicker for No, I'll be okay. All right. All right, so Jeff talked about the survey results. And I'll just tell you a little story. When um, we found out we were going to be doing a downtown assessment in Carroll, um, Jim Thompson and Jeff and I talked about this and we thought, uh, what are we gonna tell Carol? Th this is a good place. This is a place with a lot of businesses. This is a place with a lot of retail, which we, we never see in, in downtown areas. But then as Jeff said, when I, I got the short straw of tabulating open-ended questions on the survey, so I felt like when I was done with that, I lived in Carol. <laughs> uh, but, but when I tabulated those, I was surprised by the negativity of people that live here relating to the number of businesses in the downtown area. It, 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 it shocked me. And I couldn't figure out if it was, it was one of two things. Either people that live here don't go downtown very often and in the stores, which I thought was unlikely, or two, 
Y'all are so shell shocked by a JC Penny closing or a sporting goods store closing that that's, that's all people focus on. The other thing is you do have an unusual mall system in your downtown, which we never see. So a lot of those businesses don't have outdoor exposure, so you can't really see what's in there. So it's kind of a perfect storm, I think, of, of things going on. But I don't think it's a, um, it's an issue you can take lightly, that, that um, negative image that people have about the business community in the downtown. I think it's something you gotta uh, do something about it. I believe it's, it's crucial. Um, oftentimes we're doing these assessment visits and teaching communities how to recruit businesses. We didn't wanna do that here. You've got businesses. We understand that there are some voids, some business voids, so that's, that's kind of where you focus your efforts on business recruitment, which we'll talk about in a second. But we think that, and I, and I gotta tell you, you know, you're probably thinking that these guys come in and tell us to do all these things and they cost a lot of money, and yes, yeah, some of them do, some of them don't. But it does take investment to get some of these things done. But we think it's an absolute must to do some kind of a multifaceted <coughs> marketing effort to promote what's in the downtown. Just, just to get people happy and excited about going down there. Um, and we also learned here, that lots of times it's social media marketing that's the best, and I think that's still the case here. But the more we talk to people in Carroll, we realize that um, there are a lot of people that still respond to old school kinds of marketing efforts in town, like, like uh, uh, radio, newspaper, posters on, on, you know, on windows and things like that. We think it's all important here to, to capture all the people in, in town. You got to be creative. You got to brainstorm. I don't think any of our, our people on this team would consider ourselves uh, retail marketing experts, but we've seen communities uh, do marketing things to address the problem that you have. And that's a lack of familiarity with the, the business community downtown. Um, so we think it's, it's, it's got to be a combination of a hired professional that helps you out with this, but then also using local talent. We, we talked to some, we talked to high school students, and my goodness, there were, there were uh, two or three just very bright, in this case they were young women, that could actually work for the Chamber of Commerce, I believe, and um, they've done some video recording and some social media stuff like that. But I think there's an opportunity for a combination of that to get the word out about your businesses. <clears throat> but we would, um, uh, I'm gonna show you some, uh, some stats in a second. I, actually, I'm gonna go there now. How many downtown businesses are there? Now, when I ask this question, you gotta know, some people answer this survey saying there were almost none. But how many downtown businesses you think there are? Anyone want to guess? Throw out a number? You're all quiet. It's 60 plus in your downtown area. Now you might you might be saying, well, that they're not the right kinds of businesses. But mom, you guys, we've been around. We've been to all kinds of cities in the state. Uh, you have a lot of really cool uh, businesses, and a lot of them are retail businesses. We also heard there's no parking downtown. Uh, there are 420 parking spaces in the downtown. When, when we drove around the downtown, we thought there's parking everywhere. Now we did hear from people saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to, we're not going to park a block from the store we're going at. <laughs> we heard that. It, and and I, we don't have a magic solution for, for that one. We're so, going around the block three times. Yeah, we're around the block three times. <laughs> I'm going to go back to this slide here. But I think you've got to get back to some marketing ideas. And one of them is, is just the advertising marketing of the businesses. Um, maybe doing some business highlights. We talked to the uh, newspaper and the radio person in one of our interviews. And apparently in the past they used to do some joint like business highlights. You know, they would focus on a business, and we weren't really sure why that went away, but they seemed really eager to bring something like that back, just to focus on, on, on individual businesses. Maybe those are ads, maybe they're videos, social media kinds of things. Um, I would do something, you see the shop downtown Lafayette, I'm not sure where that is, but I would do something like that, but also talk about the 61 businesses that are available to shop downtown. Uh, 
Um, if you go to my last bullet point, cluster-based advertising too. You have five shoe stores in town. At least. At least. Yeah. Plus Walmart and Bob Bombard probably sell shoes too. That's a lot of shoes. I mean, we've been in communities like this that have no shoe stores in the downtown. I did ask somebody the question, do you, do you guys work together? And the answer was, well, of course not. <laughs> but I think you could. I think you could do advertising and marketing based on buy your shoes here, people. We got all these stores. Um, downtown fun facts. Um, even doing image ads um, relate to the number of businesses you have, but also the number of free parking spaces, because there's also this misconception there's no parking downtown. Sometimes it's kind of kind of confused the parking. Jeff, Jeff, put count, Jeff actually went out. This high, this high paid individual was went out and counted parking spaces. <laughs> I will not swear by its accuracy, but it's close. Okay. <laughs> but other things you can do, we've seen communities do 50 great things you can do in your downtown area. Putting things out like this. A to Z ads, that's promoting everything you can get in your downtown and, and promoting the, the breadth of, of retail products and services you can get that start from, with the letter A to the letter Z. Um, marketing your business clusters like the shoe stores or the apparel stores. We don't see a lot of apparel often in our downtowns anymore, but you have it here. Um, online digital directories, uh, holiday catalogs of things you can buy in your downtown. Um, Shop Iowa is a um, is a vehicle through IEDA where businesses can actually uh, market their products online, and it's, it's been a pretty successful tool for us. We don't believe there's many Carroll businesses that take advantage of that. The vacuum place is all over it, but I didn't see a lot of other names there. Um, Sam, you want to briefly talk about this? This is a project you worked on. Yeah, you bet. Uh, this is in Prior Lake. We, did, we had a similar experience in Prior Lake here where off of a highway, who, who knows they need to turn down a little downtown spot? Um, and the city wanted to do a kiosk that listed every business on the kiosk. And we know how hard that is to keep up to date. You don't want to keep going through and changing your kiosk every other week when businesses are coming in or going out. Um, so we worked with the city and we came up with the QR code, but then took it to a GIS storyboard and we created this for them. And it's their downtown. So if you Google Prior Lake Downtown, you will get their storyboard of how, where to eat at, where to shop, where to dine, what the Civic is, and what the parks and trails are. All really quick on your phone or on your computer before you go out. So you know where you're going, you know what the businesses are, and then each one of the business has a direct link to their website. So you can check their menu, you can check with their store hours, you can do all of that just from your phone, quick link, quick access. Uh, we posted these in two locations in their downtown, so we copied the rail users and made a kiosk that said, this is where you are, this is the downtown, scan this link, see what's downtown. So it is a cool way to just kind of get out, be there, you know, we all have our own little mobile kiosk in our pockets, our hands, so let's find ways to take advantage of it. And everything we're talking about here is to dispel that myth that you don't have anything downtown, because you do. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can do physical improvements too to help out with this. Um, windows that are, are, are lighted. Um, and you do a pretty good job with this. We, we drove down, what's it, Adams? Adams Street last night and, and most of the windows were well lit and you've got some amazing window displays, which is important also. Um, some communities do actually do kiosks. Of business directories, these are a little difficult because the shelf life of the name, the business names are difficult. So you've got to design one where you, you, you can make that work. This one is in, in Fairfield, Iowa. Oh, obsolete business signs. I can understand why people miss J.C. Penney's when the, when, when the damn J.C. Penney sign is still up there. See, I did it. We're, 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 we're going live and I'm swearing already. That's what, that's what happens. Take down those obsolete business signs. It, you know, it just reminds people of something you used to have that you don't have anymore. And there are other, other signs like that too. Um, store hours uh, being posted and consistent is very important. I'm not going to talk much about store hours because it's, it's a hard nut to crack. But we heard in the survey um, loud and clear that, that residents are not happy with business store hours. 
That's length of hours, that's consistency of hours, that's keeping to the hours you have posted. Um, and then um, the other thing, I don't have a slide here, but just signing the parking areas better might help you also. This is not unique to Carroll. Almost every downtown assessment we do, we talk about this. Businesses do a fantastic job inside their store. But when you're standing outside, Jim and Jeff and I have been on these visits, we always say, would we have gone in there? Because maybe the outside appearance, appearance it isn't as high quality as when you get inside. And we, we saw that here too. You have amazing stores. And some of them do a great job on the outside too. But sometimes the signs don't tell you what the business sells. So you wouldn't go in there. It, 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 it's an obscure sign. So do a sign on it. Walk around town. You know, take a look at the signs. If you own a business, step outside your store and take a look and see if it's inviting. Um, windows that are, are, have transparency. Um, the Jenna Bug sign. We, we like this one. It's a window sign, but you can clearly see that it's a baby boutique. You know, some of the stores you don't know, you don't know what it is. Um, it's good to have open signs or flags outside just to show people that, the, that you are open. Spilling out merchandise, if, if you can do that. Uh, sidewalk seating. We could talk for a day about welcoming facades. You know, facades that are transparent, that you um, that look good and want to bring you in the store. Very important. Um, and then um, event-based familiarity, too. Jeff's going to do a theme on event events and... and events and activities next, but I wanted just to hit a couple of things. Um, we heard that the jingle and mingle, or is it mingle and jingle? <laughs> we argued about this. Okay, jingle and mingle. We heard that that was one of the best events you did, and we thought it was a good one for the problem that you have, too, with the lack of familiarity about businesses, because you're getting people inside the businesses. Um, we would do more more things like that, and that could be scavenger hunts, it could be store drawings, it could be uh, cluster-based events, uh, similar uh, stores um, doing um, events like ladies' night out promotions, cash mobs. Cash I'm, mobs are great. Cash mobs are great. I can tell you about that later. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll, I'll spell that out <coughs> in the, uh, the, the written presentation. But these things all work to get people in stores, and I think that, that's what Carol needs. Oh, I've got another one here. Um, I, this doesn't have anything to do with the issue I was talking about, but I did say, yeah, there are some business voids. The one thing that we noticed as a weakness for downtown Carroll, you need types of businesses that bring people specifically to that business on a regular, regular basis. And you know what those are? It's usually food-based. So it, it, it's, it's restaurant, it's bakery, it's um, uh, coffee, it's ice cream, might be candy, because when you go to those businesses, you tend to shop in the other stores too. Um, so um, we're not going to talk about business recruitment, but you can do some cool signs like this saying, I wish I was a bakery, you know, but post it in the window. Uh, figure out who's in charge of going after these kinds of business types. And I, I would even go as far as to do some business incentives like rental um, rebate programs for those specific business types. Jeff, I talked too long, didn't I? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm probably going to talk more. Bit. Thanks, Jim. So Jim just talked about uh, business identification and kind of business branding. Uh, I'm going to talk about, we're calling it activities, events, and experience. And I'm going to start out with the experience side of it, too. And you know, how do we go about creating that memorable downtown experience? Think about the places you've traveled to the places you yearn to go back to, the places you remember, what made them memorable? What, what, what about that experience makes you want to go back? A couple of things to start out with here is just finding downtown Carroll. Everybody in this room knows where it's at. Ever, not everybody, a lot of people in this room probably would say, everybody knows where downtown Carroll is. I can tell you when I came two weeks ago to take some photos ahead of time, I don't recall seeing a sign that said downtown Carroll. In fact, I turned on Main Street, probably blocked earlier than I should have because I wasn't sure uh, where does downtown was. So just think about how you can highlight where the downtown is. And it can be things that are very elaborate and involve a lot of expertise like 
the valley junction arch that you see there in the lower left. But the upper left, um, that was an Eagle Scout project in West Union, Iowa. So I mean, these things can run the gamut from cost and time, but just think about how to get people more aware of where downtown is. <coughs> and then we also heard about um, walking. And Jim's already touched on this a little bit, and I'm gonna touch on it a little bit now. There are some ways to use signage as well to encourage people to, to walk and to point out to them what's at the end of that walk, how far that walk is, how long that walk is. So if you look at a lot of historic downtowns all across this country, outside of this country, a lot of those downtowns seem to always be about a thousand feet in length. Because that's the point in time when it doesn't feel like you're actually going on a walk. It's, it feels very manageable, you can see where you're going, and it holds true here too. Actually, it's even more compact in Carroll than it is in most of the downtowns we're in. It's a thousand feet all the way from the northeast corner of Brothers on Main to the southwest corner of Thomas Plaza. And to put that in another perspective, if we were right over here at Walmart, and we parked in the middle of the Walmart parking lot and walked to the back of the Walmart store, that's 500 feet. Even from where I show the parking to the front door is about 200 feet, and that gets you from this little west gate mall parking lot to the middle of the mall, and the 500 feet gets you to the center of Adams Street. So if you think about it in that perspective, just think about it different visually. Um, you have a very walkable downtown with lots of ample parking. And just to give another visual, we took Jordan Creek Town Center. So Jordan Creek Town Center from end to end, 1,800 feet. And again, remember, your entire downtown from northeast to southwest corner is 1,000 feet. So if you overlay Jordan Creek, Think of your downtown from Brothers to Hibbets, that's like walking through Jordan Creek Town Center. So maybe now all of a sudden you think your downtown is a little more manageable and very walkable. And part of what also can help things be uh, seem more walkable and make them more walkable is making those uh, destinations more visible and also thinking about pedestrian safety. So I'm gonna have uh, Sam talk about this in just a second. But this is your um, downtown. So uh, Adam Street there on the kind of the center right, and that's the parking lot to the west of the, the Westgate Mall entrance. A couple of things to note here. Um, well, actually, let's have Sam talk about this. All right. That's what he does every day. So you All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so uh, in our meetings, we heard about, you know, people don't want to park over here. And I went over there and I was like, I didn't even know that was a road. I thought this was just a crazy parking lot that people were speeding through. Um, so the way it's organized, it didn't feel right that we had a road cutting off the entrance to the mall. Um, so we looked at a different way of like, how can we make that road slow down, put parallel parking on the road possibly. When you have cars parked on a road, you'll drive slower. It's not a thoroughfare straight through. The other thing I don't have shown on here that we just talked about Actually, at lunch today, we were crossing right here, and we were talking, and we almost stepped out and caught a speeding vehicle um, going through that intersection right there. Um, right, racing delivery truck, actually, racing across to get across the tracks. A uh, four-way stop would go a long ways right there, slowing cars down. And we want cars to go slow in downtown. We don't want to speed cars through town because that's the people we want in town. You know, if they have a hurry to get somewhere, okay, sorry, but you're going through our downtown, please respect it. You know, that's how we need to look at this of, yes, you have a lot of cars, we need to go slow, look out our windows and see what's going on. So some of these things, we, we took the parking lot here, we rotated it, and put the drive aisles going the opposite way, and put a, a major crosswalk that would then cross into the main entry into the mall. Um, another thing we did is we cut off all the individual cat, cow paths, actually, that go across from the parking lot, across the road into those doors, just felt really underserved. So creating more of a plaza entry on the front. So you get to the front, you can have more of an exterior shopping experience on those uh, buildings there on the, on the west facing. Um, this also provides opportunity um, as we look at it of how to have that destination 
you know, we talked about if you're going somewhere, you want to see where you're going. Um, we're, we've got some more slides that we did some additional work on the mall of how do you open this up? You know, can we, I know some of our groups said it, blow the top off the mall and open it up. What, what would happen? So we're going to talk about that more. I don't want to get into it, everything here, but that thought of what if that mall that was not an enclosed hallway? What if it was open? When you park here and go and you look across the mall, you could see all the way to Adams Street through a corridor and not have to go through doors. Um, more likely to walk it, more likely to uh, experience the shops on the inside, provide that more exposure. Probably talk while I'm on going now. Thanks, Sam. So, continuing on that theme about walkability, pedestrian experience, the memorable downtown <coughs> environment, we need to be thinking about ways we can inspire walking, you know, make the journey pleasurable, uh, make it of interest. You know, right now, um, you've got some great bones, there's some great amenities down there, but the uh, streetscape actually is a little stark. And what we really want to do is for that pedestrian, that bicyclist, even that motorist who's uh, traveling slowly through the downtown, you know, we want to engage them every 20 feet. We want to have something for them to look at, to hear, see, smell, something that grabs their attention, makes them want to go down to see what's in the next storefront, and the next storefront, and the next storefront, and what's around the corner. So we're going to talk about a few ways to do that. And you've, like I just said, you've got a lot of great foundation already placed here. Your, your little uh, bump outs or bulb outs at the intersections uh, really are, are quite, quite well done. Uh, you have great um, pedestrian scale lighting. Um, you've got some store owners who are showing their sense of pride with some of their outdoor uh, little planters and benches and so forth. You've got some nods to your history here on the Lincoln Highway. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission has done probably the most detailed work I've seen in any community in Iowa as far as the history of every building uh, in the downtown. It was a great resource for us, and I think it's a great educational um, opportunity as well, and another way to help uh, further build uh, the community pride. But you can't rest on your laurels. So we heard that from at least a couple of the groups we met with that, well, maybe we rested on our laurels a little too long because we know we're a regional hub, but now we're going out to other places, we'll not name them, but not far away, who are doing things and we're wondering, well, why are they doing it? Why aren't we doing it? Or why isn't it in Carroll? So we have to be careful about not resting on those laurels, and we have to be careful about not just always remaining uh, the same. And I put this slide in here, and it's kind of hard for you to see back there. And I know change is hard, but change happens all the time in your downtown. If you were looking at this sign, you would see on there there's about 20 different changes that have happened in that building. So change is something that's taking place all the time in your downtown. So what are the opportunities for change now? to build on those laurels and continue Carroll as the regional hub. So think about how do we add to the ambiance and that pedestrian experience. There are a few key pieces, and you have many of them already in place, but we can enhance them. The lighting is great, but maybe we can add some flowers and banners, one or the other or both, uh, to that lighting that you have. You've got planters, but right now there's nothing in them. I show some examples below of some seasonal planting or displays in those planters from other Iowa communities. I wanted to go into the flower garden and over to the Hallmark store into the True Value and start grabbing decorations and, and do the planters over last night, uh, but these guys wouldn't let me. So. <laughs> maybe next time, maybe tomorrow, something we can all take on. Um, seating, you've got some seating. Um, it's all focused either now on the corners or at the mid-block crossing. There's a straight bench or two that maybe the owners have put out. But think about ways to add to the, to the seating. And then we also heard a lot about the events around downtown are great, but some of what drives where our events are is where there's shade, where there isn't shade. So think about how we can add more shade to the downtown. If you look at the historic photos, you got a lot of great examples of um, awnings um, before. Um, you've got some nice trees on the corners of the intersections, but I think there are opportunities through use of awnings and trees to add more shade to make a more comfortable experience downtown. Um, bike racks. I noticed one. 
Um, but maybe it's not in the best location. If there was a bike park there, it would block, I think, some of the access to the parking next to it. But think about bikers. There's a lot of biking that we hear that happens in this community. You've got the great trail system. We've had some thoughts about how to connect the trail to downtown um, to encourage more bikers. So we'll have to think about bike racks. Public art. You have a public art commission. There are lots of opportunities that I see for public art, but there's not a lot of it that I noticed, at least in the downtown gap. But think about those opportunities. And again, we're trying to appeal to those, to the visual senses, the, the smell, the, the hearing, all of those kind of things when we try to create that ambiance for the downtown. And then just the simple things like restrooms and water and parking and making sure we've identified all of those. Um, and there's some great examples in Iowa too where I see of um, for water, you know, not just thinking about your typical spigot, but even the little businesses that put out the little bowl for people walking their dogs downtown or um, having, you know, kid-sized drinking fountains. All those kind of things go into creating a full type of streetscape that creates the type of atmosphere to encourage you to spend more time downtown. To get into some more specifics, I'll just touch a little bit because Jim already talked about it too, but signs. Signs need to tell what's in that store, what you do. Um, they think about how they also can help portray the community brand, or again, that opportunity to lure you down the street to see what's in that space. Um, think of them as art. How could you marry up some of your programs in the, the school here, whether it's art class, the marketing class, industrial trades, metals class with your local sign shops? to really do some artistic approaches to signage. We really encourage the use of what we call blade signs. They're the ones that are perpendicular and stick out from the building. So as you're walking down the street, you can see them. If I went back to the slide from a couple of photos ago, you can kind of see it there, but if you look down the street now, you can't, you have no idea what's down the street. It was back further than I thought, whoops. That one right there. If I'm standing at the mid-block looking down, I have no idea what's down the rest of that street right now. So think about those blade signs and their opportunities to help uh, encourage continuing to walk down the street. Like the signs, think about the blade sign or the sandwich board signs too up on the street. You've got a couple of good examples of that here already. When you talk about signs, don't forget to tell people where that public restroom is. It's great that you have one that's in the mall, but I don't think unless you're in the mall, you know that it's there. And the other problem you have is when the last mall owner, store owner goes home for the day, they close the mall, now the restroom's not an option anymore. So if you're thinking about those, identify the parking. And I threw the lower one in the right, because I think it's kind of fun. I don't know why they're talking about public restrooms are fun. I don't think I've ever had this conversation before. But that's Bryant Park, <coughs> in the middle of New York. And that's the interior of the public restrooms in Bryant Park. It's like an award-winning restroom. It actually attracts people to Bryant Park in New York City. So if you do these things and do them well, um, it also could help them maintain themselves as well. You're finding your niche, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, <laughs> window displays. Jim touched on those, but we really wanted to reinforce them couple of reasons. One, they're really important for marketing your downtown businesses, but two, you have some of the best collection of window displays that I've seen in all the downtown assessments I've done. They're really well done in many cases, and you have lots of well-lit ones. I can think of the last couple of communities I've been in, maybe we found one lit up at night. And last night, almost all of them on Adams Street were lit up. Um, so it was really fantastic to see. You even have some nice ones inside the mall itself. Uh, so continue that. And those of you who maybe don't have that window display now, or maybe your neighbor doesn't have that window display, offer your expertise, because you've got some people here who have some really good talent when it comes to window displays. Um, so really encourage that. And then also think about other ways to appeal to the senses and create that environment that you want to linger and hang out downtown. There are communities in Iowa, um, Woodbine, um, DeWitt, there are many who have music playing in the downtown. Uh, whether that's seasonally or year round, I think it would really add to the festivity and the, the festive feeling of downtown right now. 
We've been working out of the chamber. Um, every day we've been walking past the, the little lighted sign that plays music when you walk in front of it. It makes me dance every time we, we go past it. So think about that. Think about, again, the art. The two <clears throat> on the right, this is actually in an alley in downtown Ottumwa. And this is actually at their mid-block crossing in their downtown in their uh, little bump out areas. They've incorporated all kinds of different uh, local art. Um, it's been really well done. Here's actually, here is DeWitt, and here's the little speaker up on the pole, but they've got them up and down the entire Main Street. Bakeries, I just always like to think about the place you walk by and smell so good are the ways to bring that feeling to, to downtown Carroll. And even on the right, this is actually in um, Holland, Michigan. Um, it's a little street corner bump out like you have here, but the flowers add the color and the seasonal um, opportunities there as well for decoration. The other thing they did that's um, really cool is there's actually, this is a fireplace. So it kind of helps extend the season and also kind of creates this little <laughs> gathering room um, in their downtown and a little gathering outdoor living room space. So if you put all those things together, you really end up with a, a great environment that encourages shopping, lingering, and community gathering in your downtown space. And this just shows all of those pieces really being brought together in one spot. And this is downtown um, Cedar Falls. So now moving on to um, talking about the activities and events. And keep in mind, we'll add more details to all of this in the report. Events. Events are key, and I think this community expressed it in several of our focus groups. People here need to and people want to gather as a community. And we're looking for the space and the opportunity to do that. And you're already doing it with what sounds like some really fun and successful events. Jingle and mingle, um, the ridiculous days, um, the live and local. Live and local, we had a lot of conversations about that. It's an event that um, we think really provides that opportunity for the community to gather. It's a tremendous opportunity to provide that exposure to downtown that Jim talked about so people realize that those 61 plus businesses are down there and what the downtown has to offer. We think it probably could be leveraged better uh, by the retailers working with the live and local to figure out ways to turn that into even more of a retail and business promotional opportunity. Even if it's not making the sales that evening, it's making people aware of what's there and providing encouragement for them to come back um, soon thereafter to shop, dine, whatever the case might be downtown. Now we know there are some challenges there with parking and access to the businesses. So we think those aren't insurmountable. Maybe it's just thinking about a different type of stage or maybe where the stage is located, ways you can shorten up the window time that you need to put up that stage so then the parking isn't closed um, for such a length of time. But it's an event we really encourage you to continue. Maybe you marry the farmer's market with it as well, providing another reason for people to come downtown. Maybe it helps grow the farmer's market as well. Um, and also think about involving other groups in planning the events, whether it's live and local or other events. So maybe we met, some of our team met with the youth. One week the youth is in charge of planning for the, the entertainment. Maybe the next month the hospital is in charge. The next month it's the local industry. The next month the banks take that month. Ways to engage the community and provide a variety of events um, downtown. And think about those not only from a short term, but the long term impact they have. Now, there are some other event spaces downtown. Uh, we chose to focus on a couple on Fifth Street. This is the space that's right behind the, uh, the Carroll Five uh, Theater and next to the uh, just around the corner thrift store. That I think has uh, a ton of potential. So, you want to talk about uh, what you sketched here, Sam? Yeah, so I, I actually uh, went and parked in the parking lot this morning and sketched this up of just a thought on what could we do different in the space. Um, so with this, as you saw earlier, the big mural is on that wall. Could there be a gathering space there like you're sitting on the beach and you're looking out towards the theater? You talked about opportunity to play movies on uh, outdoor movie screens on the blank theater wall. 
Uh, there's an opportunity for a fire pit in that location, something to draw people there to gather. You know, when kids go or adults go to the theater, is there something to do afterwards? Is there somewhere to gather before or after? Is there something to do on this street? Because right now, there's not much to do on Fifth Street other than you can shop a little bit or eat early in the day. Um, other than that, you're kind of the blank street. So try to get some activity here. Um, the idea is, do you want to draw people in? But as you saw earlier in the photo, it's a shot through and there's a big, you know, transformer uh, right at the end. It's, it's really not that attractive. You want to go down in here. So if you want to go forward, uh, closing that off in a way for a visual barrier at the end, but still provide access. So it's not a, we got rid of the whole symmetrical look through the middle of it. So just a quick idea through the, through the space of something to do different. Oh, I can talk about the top one now. Um, so this is on the edge of the J.C. Penney's building. It's an old loading dock. Um, based on what the opportunity is for J.C. Penney's, we've got some other renderings in the further down about uh, what to do with that building or some opportunities, but one of them was outdoor dining. Could we create a loading dock into an outdoor dining location? And it sounds kind of crazy, but as I was thinking about it, it creates a really cool opportunity to have a staged level dining space that by the time you get to the end there, that gray box is actually an elevated stage for performances or some evening music, live music, mm -hmm. and you're enclosed in between two buildings, two nice brick buildings, dining, you can have overhead lights, I drew in some overhead uh, structures, um, just a way to make use of the space. It's something that you can see from the street. So I pulled it out away from the building. As we talked earlier, you want to have that destination as you're walking down the street. You see it. It draws you in. You want to dine outside. So some of those ideas of what can we do with our spaces. Thanks, Sam. Continuing on to that space between behind the theater, just think about ways to activate that, ways to bring you, bring all ages down into that space. Um, so whether it's these different games and activities, um, maybe it's portable mini golf, and maybe when it gets cold, the mini golf moves into one of the other vacant spaces on the, in the downtown business uh, district. Um, the upper right is projection art. I think this could be really fun. This could be a fun thing to work again with uh, local sign companies, local artists, the school pro school programs, and have them. It could be. You know, new art, different forms of art, it can be even just a slideshow of historic photos of Carol, uh, lots of fun things you can do there. You can take either of those blank walls in that space we were looking at, and maybe it's a gaming wall. You have the community Mario Kart gaming night races on the wall, who knows? Um, community fire pit, Sam showed a fire pit. I showed a, <clears throat> a drawing of one of other colleagues had done of a, a popcorn stand. Maybe you work with the theater, and they're the, the concessionaire, right? You just go around the corner in the theater, and you get your popcorn and pop, whatever the case is, bring it out to this, um, this community space. Here's another example of an interesting community space, and maybe this is something you could think about for some of these vacant spaces downtown. This is called the Landing Market. This was a project in Decorah, kind of a partnership between a local developer, uh, Luther College, the downtown, where it's kind of, this is kind of that bridging point between the campus and downtown, but it's like a little food court space. It's got a fireplace area kind of there in the center, really cozy seating, tables you can work at, kind of, so it's kind of a hangout, gathering, uh, coffee, baked goods, ice cream, and there's other like sandwiches, pizza, others. I think there's three or four different little food vendors in there. So again, just thinking of ways to activate spaces downtown, bring events, bring people, um, provide year-round opportunities to get more downtown. All right, thanks, Jeff. Before we get into this, just as a reminder, my name is Erin, and I am not a staff member at IEDA. I work for the city of Newton, um, and so I have sat in your seat in the past, and I have sat and thought, Gosh, Jeff, all those things look really cool, but we can't pay for that. We can't afford that. And so what I'm going to talk about is how um, collectively as a community, you can start to put all of the things in place to get there. 
and um, where I've worked over the last 17 years in Newton, um, we have been able to tap into some of what IEDA, the state and the federal governments offer for funding. Um, we've, we've averaged more than a million dollars a year since I've worked there. So, um, you know, it's, there's opportunity out there, but you just have to kind of figure out how to get there. And so before you start anything, you first need to answer the question, who is doing what? And before you can even answer that question, you need to decide who's the who and what's the what. So the who is city government, any support organizations, nonprofits, local businesses, property owners, all of them are the who. And the what is what are we gonna do? It includes technical things like reviewing all of your city ordinances and codes. Um, it is as simple as deciding what level of business support you want to do as a community. Pers who's gonna pursue the state and federal dollars? Who's gonna focus on population growth? Who's gonna focus on that? So those are some of the what's, and there might be more what's as this community bands together to, to figure out all of the what's, but if you can answer the who's and the what's and start kind of assigning tasks to different groups, you're gonna be able to get to some of the beautiful pictures that Jeff showed you in his presentation. So for the local capacity, which is what I'm gonna be talking about, I have a handful of recommendations. Um, together as a group, we thought Carol needs to identify a community development official. Now that doesn't mean you have to hire a community development director, or a city planner, or a economic developer, um, there is a lot of great talent that we met in our visit today, so you can lean into this. Um, you don't have to have a new hire. You don't have to add that position to the city payroll. Maybe that's coming for you at some point in the future, but you don't have to do that right away. Identify persons who are working in these areas already. Elevate and support those persons. Help give them the tools that they need to succeed. and. You know, that can be a simple, a well-defined vision for the community um, and objectives for that person to kind of strive for. Also, there is an opportunity here to elevate, explore, and enhance your relationship with the Region 12 Council of Governments. Uh, Region 12 offers a lot of great resources for planning, for grant writing, for visioning, all of those things you can, you can seek help from Region 12. You want to set up the city for success. And so before you do anything, before you make a big investment, you need to make sure your house is in order. So take a look at all of the allowed uses, you, allowed uses in your zoning ordinance. I looked at your zoning ordinances. I can think there's probably half a dozen really cool creative ideas I heard for the J.C. Penney building that I'm not sure are allowed in the list of permitted uses. So before you can do anything, you need to make sure your list of permitted uses for your zoning districts are appropriate. And, and that's, a, that's not a critique or anything. We all have to take a look at those from time to time. Zoning codes are evolving documents. Jim mentioned, get rid of the J.C. Penney sign. Well, take, it, take a look at your sign ordinance. There are communities who have restrictions on how long a closed business sign can remain up. Six months, one year, 18 months, you guys decide what's most appropriate for you. And then establish some design guidelines for your district. How do you want it to look? Those guidelines, they don't have to be mandatory, they don't have to be prescribed, but if you have guidelines that everybody's on board with what we want long-term the finished product to look like, that gives everybody a visual vision to, to, to work towards and move towards. And Jim's gonna talk about that more later, so I'm not gonna step on his toes too much. <coughs> Encourage business to business Mentorship and collaboration. There are tons of talented business owners and entrepreneurs in, in Carroll. And 
really cool things happening and really cool ideas, maybe there becomes an avenue to share those ideas. Maybe they are lunch and learns they have. Maybe you guys all get together in each other's shop for, you know, even if it's just a half an hour and share best practices and have meetups and see what everybody's doing. Understand what your neighbors have in their businesses. So when Aaron from Newton comes shopping and really likes a product, you can send me down to the next store and say, hey, my neighbor down the street also has this you might really like. Um, that's not competition, it's, it's building off of each other. And if, you, if someone's sending me down to that business, maybe they're gonna send somebody else to my business. Become best friends with the Downtown Resource Center. Become best friends with, uh-oh, become best friends with Jim Thompson. Wow. You're in the backwards alignment. There you go. There, I think I, there I am. Okay, yeah, I mean, oh, I think I'm funny. Um, apply for, start applying for applications. That's grants or designations or different programs. I think Jim said there hasn't been an application submitted from Carroll. Well, you can't get state money if you don't apply. Um, kind of like Jim was saying yesterday, you can't win the lotto if you don't play. It's, it's sort of the same sort of thing. And you're not going to be successful every time. Be okay with that. Learn from every failed application. I mean, we talked about the Iowa thriving communities. Newton applied for that. We didn't get it. But you know, know what? We're going to apply again next year. And we learn from the comments that we receive back. So you're not going to get it always on the first time. And that's okay. It's a learning process. And you build those relationships through that process. And, and can then become, begin bringing resources to the community. Create local grant programs, even if they're tiny. It is hard to start a business. It is expensive and it is risky. So having local grant programs that help a new business by their sign, that, that is a great help. Helping existing businesses, because we don't want to just have new businesses. We want to support and grow and retain our existing businesses. So local grant programs that help with building improvements, facade improvements, um, signage, all of that, it's, it's not a huge investment, but it's a partnership on the part of local government and the businesses. And then finally, I want to take a quick mention because it came out in a lot of our things. And this is not a downtown specific issue but it's, it has significant impact, and that is address your community-wide housing needs. Having adequate housing stock is important to having a stable population and a growing population, a growing economy, which has a direct impact on your downtown. So there are two things I wanna focus on here, and that's downtown housing. When you have people living near your shopping centers, that foot traffic, brings exposure, it brings shoppers, it brings vibrancy. And then if you're, if you're gonna encourage development of maybe let's say higher end housing, utilize TIF to support that. When you use TIF, the state of Iowa requires you to take a portion of that new tax increment and you have to put it in a low moderate income set aside fund. And those dollars are to be used for supporting low, moderate income housing projects across the community. And I bet you guys don't realize what low to moderate income means. In Jasper County, where I work, 80% of the median household income in Jasper County is LMI. And that is for a single person, $47,000 a year. So we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about young people who are just starting out, we're talking about people who are um, skilled workers, who um, you know just don't have huge salaries. There is a need for housing like that. And so um, you can utilize the development of your higher end homes to support more affordable housing in your community as well. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim. Everybody still awake? 
<laughs> I'm last, you guys. So I'm going to start off with um, what I always tell crowds. It's never my intention to offend you, but I might. If you ask me a direct question, be prepared for a direct answer back. It's what I do. Every day at the Economic Development Authority, my job is only one thing, to try to find money for projects. And people call me and say, how can we do this? Here's what happens. Sometimes city government doesn't play well with others. Sometimes property owners don't want to partner. And sometimes the project is just not a good project. When I review those, I'll tell you what the issues are. But I work with lots of city governments to try to say, how do we work together to get what you want? This is a wonderful community. And I'm not positive everybody that filled out the survey feels that way. But I'm here to tell you, I travel the state. One of the questions I always ask myself, would I consider living here? My answer is absolutely yes. And guess what? Each one of you that lives here can be that spark of positive attitude, or you can drag everybody else down with you. You got to decide. When you love your town, it shows every single time. And if you don't love this town, life is way too short. Go find a town you love. But this is a good town. Please look around and be appreciative of what you have. We did. And we like what we saw. Now, do you have things that have to be fixed? Yep. So does every other town we go to. You have the ability with your population to get things done. So it's really time. We just got to go to work. The last two categories. The first one is buildings. I put this picture on here because not, not to say I hate the building. I actually love the building. But what I want you to look at is the first topic, a design guide. These are meant to have windows in them. When you reduce the size of the windows and put inappropriate material on them, it hurts the assessed value of your building. When you hurt the assessed value of your building, you're also hurting the assessed value of the buildings you touch. So it's not just this. This is one of those things that when you start improving buildings, you change the whole funding stream. Everyone's value starts going up because you're next to buildings you're proud of. So design guide is first. We're going to talk about incentives from the city level, the local level, and the state and federal level. We're gonna talk about some individual buildings, and then we're gonna talk about some downtown multi-tenant issues and opportunities. There is never, ever an issue without it leading to an opportunity. You guys get that? If your glass is always half empty, you're always going to be wondering where the rest of that glass is coming from. It's time for us to start thinking our glasses are half full. Yours is. Here's the design guide. What this is, this is a tool. Do you guys get it that I have a big mouth and know how to use it? <laughs> <laughs> we begged for this example for over 20 years, and many of our directors at the Economic Development Authority would never allow us to do this. We shouldn't be telling towns what to do. Well, don't we want to demonstrate best practices? Yes. 
So, <laughs> Debbie Durham, thank goodness, I told it. <laughs> you guys have to get used to me. <laughs> I told Debbie Durham she's the nicest bulldog I've ever worked for. <laughs> but she allowed us to do this. So this design guide is really saying it's built on a principle of visuals. Don't do this, do this. Let's do what we, let's demonstrate the activities on buildings that we want to see. There's 50 some pages of this that really say, don't fill in those windows, don't put weird pitch roofs on flat building, flat roof buildings downtown. Let's make sure that they look good. Let's respect the historic integrity of a building. I didn't say historic preservation. I'm saying appropriate rehab. So we want to encourage doing no harm to a building. When we start putting metal slip covers and vinyl siding on downtown buildings, we really don't know how much damage we've trapped underneath there. So we stayed at the Carrollton. The picture in my room was a historic picture of Fifth Avenue. I had to catch myself, just like most of you might catch yourself. It was like, well, gosh darn, look at those cool buildings that were there before urban renewal. <laughs> we can spend time talking about what you had, or we can spend time trying to make what you have better into the future. We really encourage a downtown design guide to be tied to local incentives. One of the things that we do, I, I manage the Community Catalyst Grant Program. 250 projects have funded across the state of Iowa, $100,000 each quick math, $25 million in six years that we've invested in the state of Iowa in buildings in towns that want to make them better. We've had a couple tries here. We've never had one that got approved, but we're going to get money rolling to Carroll. But what it's really about is saying, we don't want our governor, lieutenant governor, or Debbie Durham standing in front of an inappropriate rehab, and we don't want your elected officials either standing in front of an inappropriately rehab building in Carroll. So let's do it right. The city needs to adopt this. Now it is a guide, okay? So you're not demanding this on anybody. But if you want any money, you've got to do it our way. In today's economy, almost every property owner is saying, how can I get help rehabbing my building? So if they want to do it wrong and they do it all by themselves, that's a code issue that you'll have to deal with, and Aaron can help you with that. Or let's talk and do it appropriately, and we'll give you money to help with that. So incentive-based. <sighs> so I, I gave him warning already. Brown Shoe Fit is the ugliest building in your downtown. <laughs> So yeah, so so we are talking extremes here. Ugly building, destination retail, right? Two extremes, and we got to figure out how to. This building will hurt the value of the ones it touches, okay? And we already have some pretty good. I I won't break your news. There's a good opportunity that this could get addressed. So we're going to talk with the city. <laughs> we 
we need to work on this cooperatively. This one needs to get done. Um, what's, I'll show you that in a second. Here's the other one that's a really a challenge for me. I understand above the buckle um, Masonic Lodge, right? right? How many people have been up there? Several of you. Um, Downtown housing is a critical issue across Iowa. One of the things that happens in my travels is about six, seven years ago, the state legislature allowed split classification of property, and you can have a different owner upstairs than downstairs. Not necessary on this one yet, but it could be one of the best owner-occupied units upstairs when owners invest in their own property, it's usually the highest and best finishes. When we do these surveys in Mark and Alice's towns all across Iowa, we ask who would be interested in living upstairs. And we do these little fun little things with our numbers, I'm a numbers nerd, with cross tabulations. When we ask towns who would want to live in an upper story downtown, it's always the young professionals or millennials. The numbers always say 50 plus are the ones that would like to live there or consider living there. And then they say, well, I don't, I'm ready to downsize as an empty nester. I don't want to scoop snow or mow, <laughs> mow the lawn anymore. So maybe this is a way for me to do that in a very nice, secure, cool place. Has anybody been to uh, downtown Marshalltown? It's really not all that great. It's okay. Marshalltown has the best owner-occupied housing of any place I've ever worked anywhere, and you never get to see it unless you're friends or family. And if you ask, yes, I told Marshalltown that. <laughs> But there's a really cool opportunity. You don't have very many two-story buildings. We can't afford to let this be vacant. Now, there are rules when it's next to Highway 30, and there's some discrepancy or opinions about whether or not the road noise of the highway would allow you to get incentives from the federal government to improve that. I don't care. If the money from the federal government can't go there, we've got to figure it out locally period. I think it's a waste of square footage that that's not improved. And we got to figure that out. Now, Brown Shoe Fit, um, from what I understand, you've been upstairs, I have not. I understand all seven windows are still there. That's what I understand. <laughs> Six, sorry. Maybe. What? Well, that was before I knew there were seven. So. Oh! <laughs> yeah, they're bored to death. Um, but we really think that opening that up, um, doing the perpendicular blade signs that, that several have talked about that. Um, I do a lot of walking. When you can see your destination, it's a shorter trip. So if we can start doing those blade signs, just like Jeff was talking about, it'll be easy to get people up and down that street. Now, do we need awnings? Probably. And we can do that too. We can incorporate those, put the signs above. Uh, what I like about downtown signage, you need two kinds. You need drive-by and walk-by signage. They're not the same height. They're not the same scale. We want people to park and know what they're walking into. Great display windows. Just hate what's above. But we can fix this. Oh no. <laughs> so um, we've we've talked a lot about uh, Westgate Mall and. There's issues with, with the signage from stores that are long gone, and we got to figure that out. Um, we can fix that, but something has to be done to open this up. When you walk in today, um, until you get 
about halfway down the hall to the golf um, electric golf simulator. Is that what it's called? <laughs> um, you don't even. It is not attractive. Every retailer in this room walk inside your door like you're a customer for the very first time and stop. What draws you into that space? You need to have destinations within your destination. <clears throat> the more product a customer walks by, the more likely we can weaken their wallets, right? So the mall entrance is exactly the same. When you walk in there, it's a long ways to the public restrooms. So we gotta figure that out. When I went in from Adam Street side, I did not know true value was down on the right. So I walked in. So we got to figure that out. There is an opportunity with this. It's going to take a lot of money, time and effort, and cooperation to figure this out. Uh, looking at the current conditions, it appears, I'm not a structural engineer, but there's some rough issues with the building, and we're going to have to figure it out. So money's going to have to be reinvested for this to work. Last thing. <laughs> Has anybody ever done a search for a white elephant online? <laughs> I did. <laughs> you have one, okay? Um, what I understand, it's been three years, and people can't get over it. You're living in the past, so do what it takes to finish your grieving process. <laughs> we even talked about like a New Orleans style funeral processional. <laughs> I don't care what. <laughs> JC Penney's is not coming back. Do you guys get that? Yeah. We gotta get over it. It can't affect our attitudes like that. Uh, Jim and Jeff and I think even Aaron <laughs> talked about, we gotta get that old signage off there. Uh, it's just a constant reminder of where you were. It's not an indication of where you're going, right? right? The past is over. We can't change it, but we can learn from it. So the signage has to be removed. We've got to look at possible incentive opportunities. And I told you, I do this every day. I know we can find money for that project if the city can too. That's the partnership effort, and we've already talked, haven't we, Aaron? We're gonna to work together and try to figure it out. I think uh, from what I can gather, I was here, I don't know, four or five months ago, and we talked about incentives from the state. So no catalyst applications. You do now, since I was here, have an approved workforce housing tax credit <coughs> process. We're working on others. Community development block grant is one of those ones that we need to work on that can help building condition. But we can work on those things together. Um, taking action means that Carol has to do something. So let's just not hang our heads and say, woe is me, it's too bad JC Penney's isn't there. We also heard Spurgeon's we heard Osweiler's. We heard, uh, what was another Cernet, one that we heard? Cernet's. The list is long, you guys. We heard TJ Bank. TJ Bank. Based on our rumors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, we got to decide what's it going to take. And so some of the things that can happen in that JCPenney space um, are pop up stores. That could be a wonderful incubator if somebody could figure out how to handle all of the logistics of letting others in there, okay? But producing marketing sheets that really can get in the hands of the people that are gonna do this. So I'm gonna show you a couple renderings now. <laughs> this is the Adam Street side. Uh, we asked one of our design professionals to say, is there a way that we could make two uh, locations 
on the Adam Street side to break up the space. We heard it's too big, it's too small, okay? So there are some flexible tools that we could do. We're not recommend you implement any of these until you have somebody sign on the dotted line. If somebody comes in next week and wants the whole darn thing, great. Hasn't happened yet, okay? But we gotta work toward what's it gonna take. And then on the Fifth Street side, we love this opportunity as a mural here because that's the depth of those Adam Street stores. And then three entries on that side. I, I absolutely love working in downtowns that have two-sided retail. That could create this on fifth. That actually expands your downtown and gives you an opportunity to, to do some things dragging customers down the sidewalk as opposed to I'm going to pull in the front door after circling three times <laughs> and then getting back in my car and driving three blocks to another store or could I walk? So what's going to happen in our world now is we're going to go back and put our heads together for the written report. It will have a whole lot more detail in it. We will provide you examples. We will provide you other resources like other towns that you could go visit. You don't have to believe us. Go do what they're already doing. They might be better than you, and you could learn from them. And there is no doubt in my mind that Carol couldn't do it better. There's a lot of pride here. A lot of pride here. So it's okay to be competitive. We heard Manning's doing this and Coon Rapids is doing that. Bulloni. They're great towns. You could be better. They're coming here to shop because of your regional shopping hub. They're doing what they can do. It's time for Carol now to do what you can do to make this a better place. And we want to help. The connection that you have with us is open-ended on our end. But we're never going to invite ourselves back. Okay? If you ask us for help, we will absolutely help you. But with 940 towns in Iowa, we go where we're asked to go. That was forced, Kimberly. <coughs> that was part of the reason why it was so hard to schedule us, because we're starting busy. <laughs> but we worked it out. Not an ideal time to do this. You guys get it that it's cold out, right? <laughs> but we're, we love being here. We want to help. We want to try to answer any questions that you have. Um, but before we go, if you want to find reasons to not to do anything, this is the biggest one. So we're going to work on our attitudes, and we're going to say, I'm choosing to live in Carroll, and we want to be here, and we can make this a better place. Jim, can I say something? Sure. I just wanted to end by saying that if the people that filled out the survey are right, and you indeed have no businesses downtown, I'm expecting the four or five hundred dollars I spent on Christmas gifts to reappear in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I was with him. It was like, wow, you're a good dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can buy orange. No, I got the last one. <laughs> Questions for us. Go ahead. <laughs> what, you've been to many towns and you're trying to help us create vibrancy, a walking town, more spaces to gather. What is your opinion of implementing a quiet zone given what you see, how concentrated we are in our downtown? You show us the, you know, the 500 feet, etc. Would 
considering a quiet zone be something that would be helpful to creating the vision you've laid out for us? So the question was, would it be beneficial for uh, Carol to um, investigate creating a quiet zone uh, for the railroad tracks, yeah, right? The, the trains. Yeah, because it's um, right there. And so uh, let me answer that. I'll get to your answer. The first one I ever worked on was in Burlington, and they instituted a quiet zone. Um, the trains are not, the train companies are not easy to deal with. They're, they're actually, sorry, I forget that we're being recorded. They're a pain in the butt sometimes because <laughs> of all the rules and regulations, but it can be done. So what they're going to require of you, if you haven't already researched it, is closing lots of intersections so that they have less to work through, okay? I absolutely support that though, okay? When you're in the depot trying to work on reports, it can get pretty loud and they were not blowing their whistles, they were just driving by, <laughs> you know? But I think a quiet zone is something that I believe in it. I can't make that decision for you. <laughs> But I think it's something that the city needs to get really serious about. I don't know why it'd be controversial at all, actually. We, we've been through two studies, uh, an original study in 16, an updated study um, last <coughs> November with Bolton and Mink. So we're aware of possible solutions, and they were the second study we were concerned about the negative impacts on local businesses, Maine and Clark specifically. And they they worked with us, um, giving us many options so we could take into consideration costs as well as negative impact. Well, I, so we've been through two phases. So I have two comments about that. Burlington had exactly the same concerns. Call them. They've been through this now five, six years ago, and it hasn't negatively impacted their businesses, okay? So go ask them, you don't have to believe us. Um, but now, now I'm gonna be, we understand we're the fourth group to do a study on downtown. And it's a waste of all of your time and our time if we don't get to implementation this time, okay? So let's not waste this time. We tried not to give you monumental things that are going to take, be super hard. We tried to give you some low-hanging fruit as well as fixing other things up that are going to take longer and cost more money. But it all means doing something. Um, I've worked in lots and lots of towns where they do studies and they sit on the shelf and they collect dust and then we do a new study. Ready to implement. Other questions? making um, destinations more walkable and, and increasing safety. With Highway 30 right there, how can we make our downtown safer for people that are walking <coughs> through our downtown from across the highway? Um, I'm going to paraphrase. How can we make it more walkable downtown, especially try and safe, trying to get across Highway 30? Uh, we heard um, some discussion about um, closing the Adams Street crosswalk, and I absolutely think that would be a devastating thing for businesses. Uh, you have to be able to get across that highway, and Highway 30, um, you guys live here. It carries a lot of traffic. And so when we talk about traffic calming things for downtown, that also means encouraging pedestrians. If you close the, the pedestrian crossing, you are absolutely saying cars are way more important than shoppers. And I believe that to be wrong because cars don't spend money, people do. And so we, if your goal is just to get through town as fast as you can, maybe you need to try to find a different route than driving downtown. Can I just elaborate a little bit on that? Because there are apartments you know, on the north side of Highway 30 that could access downtown. And if we start, if we can't get them across the, the highway, they can't be, in, and they're walkers, they're not able to drive. 
how do you get them across to the downtown, even across <coughs> the line, um, where the, the newspaper is? There's apartments over yep. there. Well, and I, I would even add it because we walked a lot, and I'm sure some of you saw us walking around. Carroll Street is scary as heck, okay? Even when you're in a designated crosswalk, they don't stop. We were walking to lunch today, and I swear they hit the foot feed, not the brake, when we were walking up to that corner. Um, I think that's a great place to start. Maybe even this afternoon, we can get a crosswalk into the west side of Westgate Mall. It's paint. We can do that. And I think that it's also possible to get a stop sign on Carroll and Fifth. They're driving way too fast. If you guys haven't seen that, please go walk around. We had customers tell us that they are nervous about walking into the Hallmark store when they park across the street. So if those attitudes are already out there, if I'm in business, I can't sell a whole lot of stuff unless I walk into my store. We gotta figure those things out. Um, that seems like an easy fix. Yeah, I got a question. Are there any places in Iowa that have a, a model, a city model downtown where it's only pedestrian? Um, Show what like they do over here. Sure, he's asking are there like um, model pedestrian mall downtowns in Iowa. Is that close? Yeah, pretty much where you just um, traffic off and just have... I've not seen any that work. There's lots of towns that have tried them and then reverted back. The, the, one of the ones that comes to mind is Dubuque did that and they said it didn't work and so they went back. It actually hurt the businesses. Atomo did it. Atomo did it too. That's right, thank you. Um, Iowa City. Iowa City. <laughs> That's a couple examples, right? Okay. So, um, my opinion, we want the cars on Adams. You know, I, I think there's plenty of parking there. I Parking comes up everywhere we go. You don't have a quantity issue. You have a parking management issue. We had plenty of people tell us, well, my business next door parks right in front of their store. We got to fix that. You know, let's leave those spaces for customers. Um, but not especially, we, we would not recommend going to a pedestrian mall. We, we get this written report back to you within about six weeks. But after that happens and you distribute that, we like to hear from you. So if you knock something off that we've talked about, we'd yeah. love to know that. Sometimes communities don't tell us, and then we hear these great things later. So we, we'd like to hear from you. But also, if, um, once you get that report and you need any help prioritizing or uh, just talking further about the recommendations we make, if you want to invite one or two of us back, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Any last burning questions? Thank you, everybody. You guys, it's been a great visit. Thank you.